Um, today, my topic is uh, forging with an induction heater. And um, yeah, the reason why I have been starting to use an induction heater is because my workshop it is an old cow shed and didn't have a chimney beforehand. So I get, got the quote what it would cost me to get here a chimney for burning coal. And they said, no, it costs you everything, probably around 5,000 euros. And I thought, that's quite much. Is there another way around? And around that time, uh, Emil Geis talked about induction forging, also here in the thread. And I was like, no, I'm going to give it a try. It costs me around 1,000 euros to get the machine and the cooler at that time. I think prices have risen now. And I was like, worst case, I've wasted 1,000 euros instead of 5,000. Plus the coal, getting it here, it's crazy expensive. At the moment, I think it's like 1,500 euros the ton shipped uh, to, to the workshop. And uh, yeah, so, and I am super happy. Uh, this machine has been saving so much time and so much hassle in that uh, compared to a coal forge. Uh, or in the gas forge, like before I had about 40 kilos of propane, I use 11 kilo bottles uh, and now uh, per month. And now I have maybe around 20 kilo per quarter a year. So it has been, has been a fantastic investment and has multiple times now paid for itself. Also, of course, because electricity is a bit has been fairly affordable here in Finland. Electricity prices have been tripling lately, but this is another story. So that's what made my way into induction forging. And today I show you some things which are um, a bit special in their use case. For example, what happens if your or ways you can go around if your workpiece, we're making a candle snuffer today, um, is a bit bigger than your actual coil is and uh, some ways to work around that and how to get long heats on an induction forge, which is not the strongest side of the induction forge. Like short, precise, hot heats, that's what it's fantastic for. If you're doing like, like punching holes, slitting something, it's amazing for that, upsetting, really great. Uh, long heats, not so much. And of course, uh, other than coal and gas, you're limited by the power your machine can put out. And later we will also briefly, uh, I also have recently got a European machine, which is significantly more powerful. And I will also briefly show this one at the end. But since I prepared the, um, the, the presentation with this one, and also, uh, this might be a bit more available in more places. I will show with this one. Um, the through, we'll go with this one through the demonstration. So, uh, the the biggest biggest advantage of the induction forge is the time it takes. So now I basically. Fresh, pushing two buttons and I'm ready to get going. And then the third button, which is a foot pedal, which is out of the picture. And then see how quick it goes. So it's starting to get red and we are at seven seconds now. And we're turning around 30 seconds by now, and we are up to working temperature. So, candle snuffer as such is not such a crazy project. I assume lots of you have been doing something similar. Basically, you spread out the head material thin enough.
and somewhat even to both sides so that you can that, that, that you can afterwards form the candle. And now we reach the problem because now it's not fitting into the coil anymore. So one easy fix to this is just swapping the coils, which fortunately goes fairly quickly. And it's important to turn the water off. Otherwise, um, now yeah, you might get a shower. And especially now, this would be really unpleasant because it's around zero degrees in my workshop. <laughs> Checking if there are no leaks, and they're not. And then we have a bit more room to continue. So I don't know how well you can see this on the camera, but the outside is heating in the forge significantly quicker than the center. This is due to that it is closer to the coil. And this might be, especially if you are like, I don't know, soldering something together, this might be something to keep in mind to pre maybe you have to preheat some pieces to get um, yeah, to get the heat where you want it to be. So that's like 20 seconds. We're again up to working heat. And now it's thin enough to turn turn the turn the cup. Uh, a bit some texture is of course totally fine because it anyway is supposed to look hand forged after all. Okay, now we have the same problem again, and there's yet another fix because we can also insert it like this and heat only part of the section. And then you can do this either in a appropriately sized switch or I normally use the step of the anvil. And now, uh, since we, the, the, what is important is that the fit between the uh, material you're heating and the coil is as good as possible. We could use this one, but it would be relatively inefficient. So we swap back to the previous coil. And then we're back to 
back to forging operations again. And for this, because we want that it's extinguishing the candle, we need to close this here up a bit more so that it's capable of keeping the oxygen. Here you can very well see that here it has been heating significantly more than here on the other side. Even there it's up to sparking temperature already. a bit more time but for now you can see what you what was important you could see these different methods how one can heat the bigger pieces and there is yet another trick if let's say you have like a big piece of sheet metal as I do here and uh, there is no way you ever gonna make a coil which is heating that piece. For example, this one, which is one of the coils, I think here one can see, it. yes, here one can see. It. So this is one of the coils I made, it could hold it, but it's because it's spread so far, it's super weak and it can barely, barely do any heating, but sometimes it has been helpful. So another option is to put it at the side and push the button and you can see it's already like getting warm and this is really 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 inefficient but sometimes this can help you in they are save you from making another coil in a in a bind so we're already now at 22 seconds and it's this is only two millimeter material. So this, as I said, is really inefficient, but can sometimes be much better than nothing. What you can notice is that here, where it's relatively close to the coil, it's heating more than in the other spots. And one can use this also, also, for example, if you, I don't know, want to do some soldering or what have you, one can take this up to a working temperature, but as I said, it takes very long time and it's really, really inefficient. But then again, might be sometimes better than nothing. Long heats, um, as I said, it's not the long heats are not the strengths of the machine, definitely not. Uh, the strength is quickness and short and precise heating. You can even heat like like have the stroke of your yeah, like your marking stroke here and have it heating exactly to this particular spot and not a single millimeter further. Anyway, sometimes. This is not directly what you want. So, because sometimes you want some, you want some longer heats. For example, if you're bending a big circle and doing it bit by bit, and with this technique, I have been bending circles of 40 centimeter in 12 millimeter uh, square stock. So what you do is you first bring one part to temperature, and if you take thinner material closer to the side, it will actually heat a bit quicker and better. Because uh, what, as you remember, the heat is not uneven, the heat is a bit uneven. It heats from the center to the middle. So once you have one part where you have, uh, where you have working temperature, you can slowly continue pushing through.
and this will give you a longer heat. I think my record is something like, was it something like 15 centimeter? Something like that. And then, just for comparison, just for comparison, since uh, we need one more bend here so that it's like a candle snuffer, because this needs to go like this. Um, I show you how the other European machine heats. If it fits through, well, of course it does not. <laughs> Now well, we have to go to uh, have to go to the bigger coil, and then it's again then it's not so super efficient as because then the coil is again a bit bigger than the material one wants to heat. And here it's the same principle: one screws it on. and tightens it afterwards with a, with a wrench. Um, yeah. And also this needs the water cooler. So, uh, no. You, you get, I, I just count so you get an impression how quickly it goes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. There we are up to working temperature. Yep. Give it some quick brushing. and call it good. Maybe one other piece, just so one gets a bit some comparison, like something thicker. So this is now some 12 millimeter round. And as you can see, it's significantly more powerful. So this is this is the thing with induction. Other than with coal or gas, you just need more power in the electrical circuit. If you need more power, like for bigger pieces or what have you. So. Oh. And that would be it. Any questions? We have some greetings from Thank you, Shins. That's all amazing. From Beth Holman. Yes, it's magic. And we have a question from Paul. Why don't you use immediately the bigger coil? The thing is, the ratio between the material heated and the coil is important. For example, the six millimeter, which I just showed you, and also the 12 millimeter, uh, would have heated up significantly faster in the smaller coil because there is, um, like there is so much less space around it. And that's the water running out, by the way. <laughs> so there's so much less space around compared to the bigger coil. And this is important, like the closer the fit, and you need like a centimeter to two centimeters around the, the material to be heated. Um, 
but the closer, the more efficient is the heating in that. Okay, from Beth Palmer. Go. Yes. Uh, what is efficient in coil size shape versus metal size shape? And what makes a coil less efficient or undesirable? Okay, so there are several things which go into it. Um, one thing, uh, all of these machines, I, how I understood, I'm not an electrician, I'm a smith. So um, they have like an internal coil and this external coil, and they have to have a ratio to each other. So uh, you, you have like a certain amount of tubing you can use for the coil. So uh, this limits how much uh, iterations like, like turns you can make and so on. And um, the, so, but, but back to the question. What means efficient? Uh, like, like, like what makes a coil efficient? First of all, the size in comparison to the stock you want to heat. I said like something which would be around, uh, ha having around the material one to two centimeters air uh, would be perfect somewhere there. Uh, this this in affects the efficiency the number of turns affects the efficiency. It might be, of course, with more turns, you get more, um, you get longer area heated at once. But uh, it might be that it needs so much material, like it needs so much energy that you cannot provide the energy and therefore it's inefficient. Uh, I would define efficiency in this case uh, the time I need to get the piece up to working temperature. And we have also another question from Beth. What are the two different makes or models you are using? The two different models. Okay, so this is uh, the single phase rated with 15 kilowatt. And it's not, it's like five kilowatt or something like this, but it's in 15 KVA something, I don't know. Anyway, uh, this is uh, this stand, kind of standard model which lots of Smith use. Uh, I think this is also rebranded, for example, by US Solid. I think something like this. So, and this here is, and, and they make bigger machines. They make some which are then free phase. So they have more power and they then are rated like it. 25 and I think 35 kilowatt. And they have more heating capacity. Uh, so this being the Chinese model, actually there's also Chinese writing everywhere. Um, and and the, uh, the, the, the instructions also are wonderfully translated. But uh, this is from a French company called Induction Partner. They made a Kickstarter campaign last year. And uh, no, I think it's important to support people who are going into the right direction. And I think induction heating uh, is the future also for blacksmiths. Uh, anyway, so this one here is the one which came out of this kind, I think kicks, something like Kickstarter in French uh, campaign. And uh, yeah, the biggest difference, I think, despite that this looks more sexy, is the, is the output uh, heating power. This is uh, rated at 7.2 kilowatt. So it's about, in my understanding, one and a half times as powerful. It feels more like two to three times because it's so much faster. Like when I need here, 20 seconds, so I need here like eight or seven. So, uh, but yeah, these are the two different models. Great, and we have another question from Paul. How heavy are the connections? Three times 25 amps or so? Uh, no. So this is single phase and it, it actually has a normal plug, like a lamp or something. Or la so this has like normal shuko, like single phase. And and this is free phase, and it both have 16 A fuses. Yeah, I think the, the Stuka is around 10 amps, around that. Yeah, yeah, either 10 or 16. I'm not mm -hmm. fully sure. Great.
Great. I have like, uh, this has before been a cow shed and then a car mechanic. So they have invested in uh, like 2.5 uh, cable, like, like these cables. So uh, they have a bit more uh, like thicker wiring here than would be normal. Yeah. Great. And we have another question from this search. Where did you buy the machines and how much is the monthly cost of using it a lot? Uh, this I have bought on Amazon. It, uh, as said, by then has costed around 700 euros. And the cooler at that time was 250. Now, recently, I bought the same cooler again. It has risen to 360, something like this, like three months ago. Um, and uh, this one I bought directly from Induction Partner. I think they have a resale deal with someone else. I'm not fully sure how this is going. Um, and I bought it as part of a Kickstarter campaign. So I don't know the current market price. I got it a bit cheaper, I guess. Because anyway, I bought it. Great. And how do you think is among the cost of using, for example, per hour or something like this to have a compare price? Yeah, okay. So, yeah, this, this is a difficult question. So, um, because, well, it's an easy question. If you, you can put there like a measure, I, I, did, I didn't do that. So, um, because it heats so quickly, both actually heat fairly quickly. Um, compared to gas or coal, um, and you only um, pay for the electricity like when it is heating. So uh, I don't know about your forging cycles, but for me, it takes however long it takes to heat. Here, this is like, um, let's say 20 to 30 seconds. And then I can work the steel for about one to two minutes. It's Probably, De depending, of course, on the stock size. Am I using a power hammer? Um, how low can I go with the heat? Am I working carbon steel? Uh, what, whatever. So um, I would say normally, if you forge a full hour, probably about, uh, I would say maximum 15 minutes go to heating. I think so, because if you're forging a full hour, uh, probably you take one or the other break. You need to switch some tooling, what have you. So I, I think something like a quarter of the time you're forging, quarter to a third of the time you're forging goes to heating. So let's say 15 minutes per hour. And uh, this would mean if this draws like, let's make it easy, it would take like uh, nine kilowatts per hour when it's heating, uh, then you would only need to pay like three kilowatts, whatever this then is in your local price. This I don't know. Here, this would be at the moment like one euro 50 ish. But then again, I think I'm not, uh, and, and this is not nine, this is rather like five, so it's, it's significantly less. But let, let, let's say uh, the, the French did a calculation, they could forge with this one, by the end of last year for two hour, two euro a full day. But electricity prices in French were relatively cheap. And of course, as said, you have this, that per hour forging, you're maybe like 15 minutes heating. And when it's not heating, there is only the cooler running. And this is basically like, like a, no, it's a little pump with a little fan which circulates the water. And here is another, here's the air cooler like you have in your computer. So it's, you, it, it uses almost nothing. We have another question from Beth. Tell us more about the water cooling. How does it work? What problems should you worry about? I'm a bit nervous about water and conductors and electricity. <laughs> Okay, so no, I'm neither an electrician nor a plumber. 
I can only tell from my own experience. Um, uh, the thing is, uh, the coils, like, like, like the coil is what carries the electricity. And I don't know how the water can go through there and don't make any big hazard. I really don't know that, but it doesn't. Telling from about now, not two years of experience, no problems. Um, but what should you worry about with your cooler? Uh, the machines, both of them actually, specify that you have to have to have a pressure of, I think, three to six bar. Whatever this is then in PSI, I don't know. It's in the manual of the machine. It says, it says you need this and that much pressure, and you really need this and that much pressure constantly. I think I, I lost about a month because I was like, ah, yeah, I built one of these coolers myself and then used one of these garden pumps because yeah they deliver like eight bar pressure fantastic they do it but not constantly so if they uh, face resistance they lower their pre the pressure they deliver and this you don't want so you can build these cells out of uh, i think like a car cooler pump might work or one of a laundry machine might work but you need the pressure and you need it constantly. And then, yeah, it's a pump which circulates the water. Um, and even if these conductors here leak, I don't know if you saw this, it's not harming the function. Uh, it makes sense, though, to insulate the coils, as you can see. You can see here that there the water is running out. So, as you can see with these ones, um, because when you touch the coil, it throws sparks. It doesn't deliver, at least I have not got any electric shock so far. It has just been throwing sparks and it's not good for the machine, but uh, there has been no hazard to me so far. And, uh, but I didn't have material to insulate until two, three weeks ago. So, and I didn't have the time yet to insulate. Um, what else? You want enough uh, water like so that you can run for long enough time. So they sell also these ready coolers with nine liters and they seem to be maybe not in workshop conditions how I have them now, but somewhere where it is warm. Um, they seem to be relatively quick overheated and then what you have to do is wait until it's cool enough so you can forge, you can forge again. I one time uh, like no, went to the limits of the machine, so it switched off. Uh, like, like this was not working anymore because it was saying it's overheating. And this was when I was about one and a half hours working on some Damast package. So otherwise it has never run anywhere near there. And I normally don't do that much. This was just, you know, <laughs> some trial. So we have another question from Becky. Are you making the coils yourself or you can purchase? I don't know if you can purchase them, but I have made all, no, well, uh, this machine came with these three coils and um, it makes sense to store them by the way this is maybe another nice trick to store them in something like this so that the ends are going up because after you take them off they're filled and um, now if you lose too much of the liquid inside you have to refill it and it's also messy so i i, I suggest getting something like this where they can stand upright. And I have, I have similar, similar box for the other machine. Um, yeah, I made them self. Um, I don't know how this is with the rebranded one, but this Chinese machine came here with something which is at least nothing metric I could get here. So it's a thread which is, I don't know what thread it is. I couldn't get anything similar. So what I did was um, they sell here something which screws on and then shrinks the end. And then I have uh, the, 
Yeah, here is one of the here's one of the pieces so one can see this. Um, so this has two sides with screwing, and one goes to the machine side and the other goes to the coil side. And it's important to keep these short, as short as possible, because uh, it's taking, taking uh, power of the circuit. The longer this is, the less power is delivered to the workpiece. Yo. Uh, yeah, I made the, otherwise, yes, I made them myself. They are relatively easy to make. Uh, unless you have very small diameters or very complex shapes. Um, the ones I did so far, I did basically freehand. Uh, I would in future, if I have more delicate shapes, I would fill them with salt or fine sand and uh, block the ends with duct tape or something so they don't collapse. Uh, yeah, well, I could have known this beforehand, but I didn't. and. Uh, it saves quite some hassle because when they collapse, you have to somehow hammer them open and it's, it's annoying. And you have to make like, like what I did, I blew through them every, every, couple, every couple of minutes or something or every couple of movements to make sure that there is still flow, like that the uh, flow through air and then later water is not decreased. Because this you don't want, that you have like a block in the coil. Great. I have something to add. I think the, the thread maybe is the conical thread for gas. So it comes uh, like three pieces and the ring in the middle. It is normal for gas uh, heating, but it's not that often here in Europe, for example. But we use a lot in Argentina. But it's very difficult to find. <laughs> We have another question from Serge. What's the diameter of Damascus package hammerhead you can hit? What diameter? I read again. What's the diameter of yeah. the Damascus package hammerhead you can hit? This is a good question. As said, I normally don't do Damascus. Um, what I have found is that with this machine, I can heat, um, I can heat up to 20 millimeters square, relatively reasonably. And with this machine, I have been heating already, but I also don't have bigger coils. So this is rated that it could heat 40 times 40, but a square, of course, um, or similar volume. But uh, I have only run this now up to 25 times 25 because I don't have so big coils. Um, and I assume since it's also steel, which goes in probably it's similar for the uh, for Damascus. Uh, probably uh, I have heard that some people run this up to inch material, which would mean 25 ish millimeters. Yeah. Uh, another trick which might be, which we could maybe show, what happens here is uh, when you put here a load, is um, that here's a number at which you might have noticed, and it drops. And it should not drop lower than a third, I understood, of the initial value. So minus 800, if it drops significantly lower than 300, I stop heating. And what one can do to still get bigger pieces hot is uh, heat them in turns, meaning like put, here, put it in here, push the button for, for example, 10 seconds, see that it doesn't drop too much and let the heat soak in and then do it again until you get to working temperature because uh, once it has reached a critical temperature, I think, this is when it starts to show color. So somewhere around the 500, 400 degrees Celsius range. Um, it changes inside before you have some eddy current or afterwards. They have names for this, I've forgotten them. Uh, the interesting thing is once you are over it, 
the number increases again and it's again running at good power. But until you are there, uh, it's not, and it might make sense to, pre depending on what you do, uh, preheat it in a gas forge to temperature. This is not ecologic, but it might make sense for your workflow. Preheat it in a gas forge and then get it here up to welding temperature in case your gas forge is not getting up to welding temperature. Which, maybe now that I'm at it, another thing, uh, one can also forge weld in these. Actually, fantastically, because you don't have the slack, but you still have the precise heat. I did a composite flower inside here. Um, what you though have to do is um, push as, as with the thicker material and let the heat soak in. Also with this damas, there, there I learned this. So you have to make sure that the heat goes through as all the time with forge welding. And it might need several like heating, pausing so that the heat can soak in the material, heating again until you're all the way through up to welding temperature. Great, thanks. Uh, Beth wants to add, I have seen large material heated, like 40 millimeters square bar, but keeping the water cool was hard. Maybe with the bigger machine. It's such that the, the bigger brothers or sisters, however, of this one can, of course, deliver more power and therefore also heat bigger stock. Like, for example, uh, I've seen some people in UK who have the, I think, the medium, like the 25, and they can heat up to 40 square uh, also with the Chinese machine, I understood, without any significant problems. Uh, but they also have another cooler. They have like a self-built cooler, uh, which is a bit more elaborate. <laughs> and from George? Uh, uh, it's already uh, answered. It's all right. Ah, great. It's because like, uh, yeah, like combining an oven or something with induction to, to have the working heat faster is, is a good idea ahead. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, it's such, for example, here, my gas forge goes up to... 950,000 degrees, and that's suitable for working most steels, but it's, well, one cannot forge weld, and sometimes one like, wants to or likes to, yeah. Yeah, also gas for forge weld is a little tricky. You, you use a lot of gas for forge weld, <laughs> then it's expensive. <laughs> and it's like, and the whole piece is hot. We have a question from Thomas Hagen. Could you technically force well two ends together while heating at the same time? Ah, you mean like you stick them in from both sides and then run the and then push from the side? Yes. This is technically, I, I tried this because I read, like, like before I got this machine, I read through several uh, forums and what have you. And there was, I understood at some point, some person selling these kind of machines in the US. And this was the trick how he convinced people to buy them. That he like puts two pieces together like this, hit the pedal and pushed them together and took them out, like afterwards, cooled it down, took them out as one piece. I think he sold some machines, so it seems to work. That's how I understood. And I've tried, and yes, one can do. It's almost like friction weld. Like the time in this machine has been saving. I mean, think every time you go to the workshop, you heat the coal forge, it takes you, you know, if you if, if everything goes right, like 15 minutes till you have enough uh, embers, like, like heat in the coal. And here, boom, forging for five minutes, no problem. Yeah, Becky said that that's mind blowing. And that's, that's a great trick. <laughs> and you don't have any like gas or other emissions. You can do this in a ba basement if you don't have neighbors who bother the sound of the forging. Yeah, also hit so fast that you don't have the scale and many problems. I think also one of the advantage, maybe uh, here in Europe, is you don't need to have a a, a certificate or something to, to make because when you forge, uh, when you have the forge, you need to have some uh, precautions with the fire and everything. And this is like 
connect a computer or any elect electrical device. With this model, I have to warn you, it doesn't have a CE sign, or if it has, then it is for Chinese China export and not for certified European. Uh, at the back side, I, I cannot show this now because then I have to turn the machine and one cannot see there anything. But at the back side, there is like open screws over which go like rings with the cables. And then there is a flap going over, like, like some sheet metal going over, and it says high voltage, don't touch it. Oh, no. Sounds a bit dangerous to me. One friend was asking if it came with rubber boots in case. And what about the French one? Has a certificate? Uh, I think either it has or they're working on it. I'm not sure. That there was something written about some standard is following, and it doesn't have, like, like the cable comes out like how it's supposed to be. Thomas said that I will convince my blacksmith friend to buy one together and we give the school we went to. Oh. Great idea. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And W said, yes, CE and prefer top European standards. Okay. <laughs> so less likely to die when using it. I think normally this machine, uh, when you have the spark, they cut uh, inside the machine, they cut the electricity so you don't get the shock. Yeah, and you also have the pedal okay, for... The, the, the big problem I've heard of not insulating is if you touch the coil, that short can cause the copper to erode and leak. And then you just have water pissing everywhere instead of having a coil. So that's the big problem with touching, is getting a leak. Yeah, and sometimes it's, it stops the machine, but then like from overcurrent, I think. Yeah. Uh, but some people have just been putting like uh, X-Horse spray paint on top. Oh. <laughs> also creates some layer of, it's, it's not a thick layer of insulation. But it's some layer of insulation, which will withstand most of the heat which goes there. And what are you using? No, no, I'm using because I've been introduced to the professional league. <laughs> so there is some kind of mass which is like a high temperature cement. In uh, it, it, it's like molding clay, but it's high temperature temperature cement. Mm. So I don't know where you get this normally. This machine came with some of it. And um, this, so there goes around this goes some kind of tubing, uh, th this white stuff here. I think they also use it in insulation for heaters or something. Mm -hmm. That's what I understood. And then you put this other stuff on top because this is some nylon and it will not withstand the heat. I think they comes like a mesh from glass or something like that that is is like cloth and you oh, can use it. You could and thread on. Yeah, the, the clay I think maybe is cowling, uh, the one you can use for make a uh, glass bits. Uh, you you know that. Uh, yes, I do. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a very high temperature uh, clay. So maybe it could be that one. And yes. Thomas want to ask, is flex seal? Uh, probably not, then probably not because it needs to withstand the temperature. I mean, anyway, you have here like thousand-ish, maybe degree steel inside and rubber will just melt. Yes, mm -hmm. if you just, um, no, here one can, no, here one cannot see. The other of these are burnt. Mm. So, uh, uh, they like, like this stuff, for example, also that, that doesn't withstand the heat. Yeah, I think there is a flex seal for high temperature, but I think it's around 300 degrees, something like that. <laughs> That's not that high. Yeah, yeah. for <laughs> steel ovens. Yeah, it yeah, is no. not our so, high temperature. No. <laughs> but I think the all this protection in the coil makes you work easily and don't worry about touching the coil. Is this like that? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it takes some stress out. I mean, normally I have here like a stand in with which I put yes. the material, and uh, I've now put it to the side so that I have more space to move around here. But um, yeah, it's it's so much easier if you don't have to stress about touching the coil, for sure. Yeah, using a stand seems like it would make a lot of sense. So just instead of having to be steady. This is like the normal setup. Mm -hmm. So this is paint adjustable because sometimes the coils end up in different heights and so on. Um, this is what I normally use, yeah. And before I had a different setup where uh, this table was longer and I had uh, fire bricks below. Okay. Stacked so much that they ended up in half of the coil. This is also great if you have the space for it, which I now since no, it is how it is, and I need to move around here. Don't have anymore. Yeah. Yeah. I made some operations at the other side of the workshop, which caused things to move here. So 